folks, Real Estate Renegades, and I'm here with one of the guys who thinks the exact opposite of everyone in the country virtually, by necessity. This show is all about showing some out-of-the-box tactics to uh, get the results that you want to get. So um, I'm here today live, we're over here in Perth, and I thought I'd invite Jay up to our little event here to uh, offer some of his insights. So um, Jay, I wanted to pick your brain before I let you kind of go through the presentation, because I charged you with a task. How do we get into as many appraisals as you do? But before we do, the first thing I wanted to have a chat to you about, because a lot of my guys don't believe, or they don't believe, but I'm sure they have missed the nuances of that challenge we did, like maybe, I don't know, maybe seven years ago or something. I can't remember how long ago it was. But we set some goals with you, and you drew a line in the sand, and I still have the check somewhere at home, because I never banked it, but I never threw it away. I kept it, um, a $10,000 check, with Jay Stanley's name on it, made out to me. So tell us about that, that, what happened then, why you did it, and what that check was all about. It was a while ago. <laughs> um, was it to lose five kilos, yeah, it wasn't was to, it? it? was to hit a goal. And was, lose it, it was but you didn't loss. say you couldn't put it back on. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was as simple as that. Yeah. There's a goal, punishment if you don't do it, you cough up X amount of dollars, and we did it. As I said, I think I put it all back on, but... <laughs> I lost it. But months in advance, I remember it was months, it was like nothing to chance. So um, it was really, do you remember what, have you ever tried to lose weight before unsuccessfully and what difference that made having got, you know, a significant punishment on the line? No, I've never tried to lose weight, but um, no, no, I haven't with yeah. weight, no. Okay, because again, I've sort of done that challenge again in a weight loss yeah. sense before. And um, bugger me, when there was money on the line, I was months <laughs> ahead of the goal. Months. Yeah. So it's funny that sometimes away from, see, that's away from motivation. You do something to avoid the pain of, you know. There's, I'll, I'll show you later. I, I, there's, we've got that challenge with one of my guys at the moment. And it's around getting into more appraisals. And there's a, we've already had the graphic design done. We've already got the payment sitting there with the car wrapped people. And his car is going to be wrapped with, do not sell with me, sell with, and he's got the competitor's <laughs> name up there because they're better than me or something. So there's zero chance he's going to not make his KPI, you know. So, um, yeah, man, I really wanted to... So, so before we get on to your presentation, mate, give us a sense of what I was sort of trying to articulate to the guys about the state of your market for the last, hmm. you know, decade. Well, uh, it's a bloodbath, really, Bunbury. Um, is anyone... In regional areas here outside of Perth, yep, Andra, yep. So it's probably just. I mean, I'm sure there's worse areas when you go up north to the to the mining towns, but Bunbury's been really hard work. Um, we're now selling properties. People paid, you know, three hundred for them uh, x number of years ago, and they're now dropped a hundred grand in a small, you know, in a small price bracket. Um, we've now, my brother just sold one for 23000 a one bedroom, one bathroom. And Bunbury's just a really blue collar town, you know, there's, it, so it's, it's brutal. So it's one thing, you know, to get a listing, you know how tough it is to get a listing. And then you've then got to sell it and you might have something, um, uh, you know, they paid 300000 for it, a unit site in Kerry Park. It's now on at one eighty. And you're getting no inquiries, no phone calls, no one through the opens. And that's, you know, for, for certain types of properties, there's almost no demand. And I know you reduce, you reduce, you reduce, but there's a point where, you know, you just can't go any lower, um, or they can't. So it's been really tough. Yeah. Mm. And um, would you say, because... Um we, we've talked about, about that, you know, whenever, as I said, whenever I'm sort of thinking it's tough, you tell me how tough it really isn't. So talk to us about the principle, because I was talking to Matt Steinway and you were on the mm. call, and it's funny that Matt said this thing that he said about stock levels. And I said, well, to your point, Matt, another icon of the industry, Jay Stanley over in Bunbury, and bugger me, he was on. Must be the first, I don't know if you have tuned into many of our lives, but yeah, he yeah, was on, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Speak of the devil. Jay was on the call, uh, you know, listening in. So talk to us about that principle, about how Matt was saying, well, whatever the stock levels have to be in order to facilitate the goals he wants yeah. or you want, talk to us about that principle. 
Well, last year I listed 196 properties in the financial year. That's individual sales, no subdivisions, it's one by one. And the analogy I share is the mining industry. You look at those guys, what do they do when things become really tight? They simply start get rid of, getting rid of staff first and foremost, and then the people that are working, they're generally working for a little bit less, they're working longer hours, and it's just dig double the amount of dirt to get the sim, same sort of results. And that's really what we've got to do. You've got to look at it now and say, okay, there's less people buying, there's less people selling, there's less of everything. So we look at it and say, okay, if we're getting zero to two people through a home open, more zero than two, you can't do 10 home opens. You've got to do 20, 30, 40, 50 um, to get similar sort of results. Wow. It's not rocket science. Yeah, wow. So um, that means you've built a team in order to be able to do 50 in a weekend. Mm. You've got to have teams of J yeah. out there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, wow. So guys, um, I'm, I'm loving this. We've set this up for you that um, you think you got it bad. Have a look at a guy. And again, I'll show you Melita Bell's results later. And that's what I love. She's in a place called Toowoomba. Maybe not too dissimilar to Bunbury, where she was talking to me about the seeing five opens for every... Uh, she'd say, oh, and about um, an open, a, a buyer every five opens. Not one buyer per open, but one buyer in every five opens. Hmm. So she's got to do 20 opens a weekend. But as a single standalone person, Melita Bell, 1.2 million. So there are ways to make it work still, and you're in the hands of someone now who has um, absolutely done it. So, um, mate, let's get off this stupid stage, man. And uh, there's your clicker. Ta. Slides are ready to rock. And um, All right. yeah, mate, I'll. Uh, I'll leave it to it. So, guys, so, um, give it up for our guest, Jay Stanley, and thank you for your time. No problem. So, right. Make sure that's working. Right, it is working. Beauty. I don't know if these are on timer or. I think they are. All right. So, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm. I've been in real estate for. I started when I was 25 and I'm 41. I've lived in Bunbury my whole life, third generation Bunburyite. Um, really briefly, my story of getting into real estate, it's not that exciting, but we've all got one. None of us started as career real estate agents when we were kids. Um, at the age of 19, I went and lived in a place called Kiribati, which is central Pacific, north of Fiji, south of Hawaii, in that little park part of the world. Um, I was a Mormon missionary there for two years, you know, those crazy people that ride around on bikes. That was a real eye-opener. There, there was no electricity, running water, toilets, shops. It was just really like stepping back in time. And I lived there for two years, had to learn a foreign language, and it was just a real humbling experience to say the least. I left there, came home, I wanted to, when I, when I was 18 I got my pilot's licence. And I came home from my mission and then wanted to do it through the military instead of being a commercial pilot because you had to pay for it. So I went, I left Bunbury, enrolled in Canning College in Perth um, to redo year 12 um, to go down the military path. So as I said, they'd, they'd pay for it. And I, I remember I enrolled in calculus, physics, applicable maths, all that fun stuff. And I remember sitting there for that first week and they might as well have been talking Chinese to me. It was so far over my head. And I was speaking to the lecturers at the end just saying, listen, I'm just not getting any of this. I'm, you know. And I worked back to what I knew and I realised I didn't even know fractions. So they said, all right, we'll do year 11, unenroll out of that and do year 11 in six months and then do year 12. So off I did, did that, passed all, all, all the subjects, and then you start the process of trying to get into the military. And uh, with, with that, you apply, and if you fail, you've got to wait 12 months to resit. So every 12 months, I would resit, and off I'd go again, fail again, three-strike policy, didn't make it. And it was up here in Perth. I don't know if the um, Defence Force is still on um, St George's Terrace, but I remember it when I flunked the third and final time. So as I said, I had a year to kill, and I was in Bunbury, and I was a swimming I was milking cows in the morning and night, swimming teaching during the day, saving money, go travel, and I was putting all my efforts into getting into the military. And as I said, the third time, it was up here, 
and I went for my, my last hurrah, flunked, and I remember walking back to my car, which uh, was my sister's car. I'm one of eight kids, and my oldest sister had this little barina with pink stripes, and my head would hit the roof, and I remember getting in my car, and there was a parking ticket, and driving all the way back to Bunbury, and it was just one of those days where it was bucketing down with rain. I'm not just saying this for extra dramatic effect, it really was. And I remember just tears in my eyes, crying all the way back to Bunbury, going, oh, you know, that's three years of trying, year and a half of school, you know, what am I going to do? So I'm 25, and uh, at that time we had our family business, which, which had been really successful in its day, but it was now just floundering. My older brother had been in it for probably a couple of years and was really going nowhere, just it was not something that I wanted to do because there was no success that he was getting, so why would I mentality? Anyway, because I didn't have any other options um, and it was so expensive to, do, to go down the commercial route, you know, to end up being a Qantas pilot or something, I thought, oh, well, I'll give sales a crack. Now, uh, I'd done sales before. I funded my pilot's licence, um, which cost about $20,000 when I was 18, 20 odd years ago, um, by being a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman. Now you reckon selling real estate's hard? Try that. I was selling 2000 rainbow vacuum cleaners for any of you wonderful people that have heard of them. You're nodding, have you heard of it? <laughs> so they were $2,795 when I was selling them 20 odd years ago and I was doing it at night and I'd get $400 for each one I sell and sold and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven every time I got a sale but managed to pay for my as I said, my aviation licence. So fast forward, I'm 25. That's, that's my little story up to date. And I, I'm in real estate just going, well, what do you do? How do you make a go of this game? There was another agency in Bunbury called Summit Realty and they were properly spanking us um, at that time. Like, I don't reckon you could get a more dominant company anywhere than what they were. I wouldn't be lying in saying they had 80, 90% market share. You know, we, we were just, everyone was getting schooled by them. Um, anyway, so I started in my first year, I made 49,000, which I thought was brilliant. That's what school teachers got. I didn't have any degrees. Second year, I earned 39. Third year, I earned uh, 212, and it just kept going from there. Now the little turning points for me were going to courses, which there wasn't that many of back then, 17 years ago, and just hearing people. Now I had a really good work ethic, I wasn't afraid of, of that, I just didn't really know what to do. So I hope to share with you a couple of things um, this evening or this, uh, this morning that may add to your business. What you'll see is it's just really simple. I've done a few things consistently, they're pretty ugly things, like when I hear other people talk, I'm always a little bit embarrassed by how I do it, but it, it works because it's not, it's a people game. So here we go. So the first little bit was just about my family. So I've got five kids there, they all, all are. So I've got a two, four, six, eight and a ten year old. Um, as I said, I'm one of eight kids. Um, this is our, my brother and I run out of Yeah, so my old man started the, the uh, Bar and Stanley with his business partner, Jim Barr, um, 
49 years ago, so next year will be our 50th year. Dad finished up a number of years ago, so just race and I run it. So all I'm going to talk to you about is getting listings. Now, I don't do what I'm about to show you now, but I did it for well over a decade. Um, so could, could you just push that, because there's lots of them, just every five seconds there, yeah, just scroll through until those ads are finished. So I did a lot of branding when newspaper was really big in Bunbury. So for 10 consecutive years, I put an ad in the newspaper. You know, everyone says you've got to be known, which you, you do. So I would sit there and just say, what, what are you guys doing in your business to get your name out there? Apart from, you know, home opens and the obvious, you, you really need to be doing something to become known in your area. So for me, it was 10 years, and I've got, I'm not joking, dozens upon dozens of these poxy little ads that I run, but you, you became really known in a small area like Bunbury. Um, are they all done? Still going? As I said, I haven't done them for a lot of years because the problem I found was you're just overshadowing the business by do, doing, it for, doing it so much. And then I got to a point where I bought in with my brother and and it was then not just about me, it was about the whole, the whole team. <laughs> Still going? All right, so then, if I describe that, so once a month, and, and what I'm talking about, this is 15, 16, 17 years of doing it. So every month a newsletter goes out. Now this is just an example, um, and I post them out. I've always done post, I don't really do much on the computer. Um, so one newsletter goes out a month, it just, it's a little bit about me, stuff I've recently sold, recently listed, testimonials, and it just looks exactly like that. So pretty plain Jane, but because I've done it for so long to some 3,000 people, they're used to getting it. Has this just turned off? No, it's all good. Um, so that's, that goes out every month. Um, then every year I send out my market analysis, which looks something like this. So this is all bound up, glossy, looks the part. It's got a bit about real estate, um, the statistics of your area, exactly what's sold, how much it's sold for, highest sale price, lowest sale price, an ad. And then I have, as I said, I'm one of eight kids and um, this is the bit that most people always comment to me on every time it goes out. And it just makes fun of my family members. Um, it's just all light-hearted stuff if you read the comments there. Uh, and that's, that's that. Here's my team. Okay. Any questions in regards to any of that? Pretty simple. The next thing I do is... <coughs> Um, the family fun days. Now we do this as an office and these have got bigger than Ben-Hur. I never in a million years would have thought that they would have ended up like this. So this just gives you an example. We've got our next one in November. We were doing them twice a year but I'm not, I cannot believe so many people come out for a free ice cream. It amazes me. <laughs> but they apparently do. Well, we pay for it and it's about 16000 now because it's got like to a little, well, th this is the ad on it. I don't know, the, I don't think this is the last one. Oh, yeah, thanks so much, Bunbury. Right. I'll, I'll now cover some of the tin tax. So that's the broad overview of what I do. So you're sending out a monthly newsletter to your database. People are getting invites to stuff. You know, we do movie nights and that type of stuff. Um, they know about me. So now, at, at the stage, 17 years in, what I've found now, it's not that hard for me anymore because you get traction. All I've got to do now is keep working hard and really not stuff it up. 
You know, you're getting lots of opportunities. I find I get at least two appraisal calls every day um, and then I'm generating a lot. So I'll go through because you're all sitting there saying, yeah, well, that would be good. I'd love two, at least two appraisal calls a day. That would be really easy. But how do you get to that point? Now, casting back to when I was 25 and I started, I can truly say I understand. But the activities I'm doing today are still the activities I was doing 17 years ago. So let me cover what some of those are. Firstly, you've got to become a listing machine. It's not an industry where any, anyone can sell a well-priced listing, even in a brutal market. That's not the name of your game if you want to be long-term. You've really got to look at it and say, all right, how am I going to get heaps of listings? And then you've got your listings, you simply manage them, reduce the price if required, sell them, your team member then settles them, you know, so you get a, you get a team around you. So you should have aspirations to working towards a team setup. So for me now, I have um, a lady that does the new listing, so a new listing comes in, she deals with all that. I then have Josh, who's my buyer's rep, and he sells all the properties. I then, once I've sold the properties, I then have Henri as my contracts coordinator and she settles them, and they all do really good jobs. And we all work in as a team and I explain when I'm meeting with a seller, this is how it's gonna work. So Josh is gonna be the gentleman that brings all the buyers through. So you won't be hearing from me bringing that buyer through. I'll be helping with all the negotiations. And you explain the reasons to them why. And they're like, okay, I get it. So there's no problems if you thoroughly explain a team setup. Now we get a bit precious with ourselves. You know, you think about what other industry does the person do everything. Pilot doesn't come down and give you a rug and serve your peanuts. He's up the front flying the pine and the hosties have got their roles and so it is with us. So I, I did a bad job in early years of probably explaining that. I just tried to do it all, but I wasn't really doing it. And there was a bit of a mixed message go out where now I really sell the team as a setup. So if you haven't got a team, it's pretty hard. You know, it's pretty hard to be doing it all. So you should really be shooting to get a, a first assistant on whatever basis. For me, my first assistant was my wife. Um, and she was doing half a day with me and then half a day on the property management because I didn't think I'd be able to afford both. And then quickly, you know, I saw the benefits and she went full time and then we've just grown from there. And as, as, as your income has grown, you can see that putting on a PA, buyer's rep, PA, and then with my brother-in-law. Um, so on that flyer on the back of that thing, you would have seen four people. I don't have my brother-in-law working with me anymore, but he came in as a lead generation um, role and it was working, but it didn't end up working. So I'm back to just three, which I've had for uh, over 10 years. All right, so that's my team set up. So what do I do? What does my day look like? My Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I get into work at about nine o'clock every day except for Wednesday. I start bright and early on Wednesdays, which I'll explain why. And, and uh, so I work from pretty much nine till five, Monday, m most days, most days nine to five. Um, and I get in there and soon as I leave home, kids go to school help with all that stuff in the morning. Um, I'm just literally on the phone every minute of every day. And I have my first appointment at one, my second appointment at four, my third appointment at 12, one, four, my fourth appointment at 12, one, four, five. So you've got those three hour chunks to just be uninterrupted on the phone. Now for me, I've never done it any other way. It's a bit of a knucklehead approach, sitting there calling people all the time, but what are we doing, you know? If you're not doing that, I don't know what people do. They fluff around on a computer and do whatever they, they do. I just sit there all day. Anyone that owns a home, like if I asked you at the front there, do you own a home? Yes, I do. Um, and I met you somewhere. Do you have any intentions of selling it? No, I don't. 
whatever. And you would say, oh, no, no, once the kids go to uni and they leave home, and I'll be, oh, okay, well, when's that? Oh, that's five years away. Well, that person is then in my tracking system for a five-year period. Now, I wouldn't bombard you, but I'd add you to my database. I'd invite you to some events. I'd give you some free stuff. I would call you probably twice a year as initially. And over that period, you'd probably refer me one or two people. Um, and if you referred me, I'd give you extra gifts and you'd refer me more. And then if I sold that home for you, I'd give you a night at the Crown for, for the referral. Um, and by the time five years rolled around, I've probably got one or two leads from you. And then I'm right in the box seat to list your home, if not guaranteed. And you just have that approach with everyone you meet. Now, it sounds like Perth people aren't as friendly as regional areas, and it might not work as well, but they're still people, and everyone's got the same outcomes on life, I think. So that, that's pretty much my approach. Now I get lots of people that tell you where to go and say things that aren't overly nice, but that's just water off a duck's back. Remember, I was a vacuum cleaner salesman, a Mormon missionary, so it's really not that, uh, that hard to roll with the punches there. Now, I, I've worked out that I generally call about 100 people every day. And on that video that Glenn was talking about, I heard, I sort of snickered to myself when Matt said, oh, you know, he mentioned that. You know, I've heard of people calling 100 people a day, and I get it. It's got knobs on it, <laughs> but I've done it for so long that I just, I don't know what else to do. It's just become a habit and proved so effective for me, and I'm just getting listings and listings, and it's just my way of doing it. Any questions in regards to that really complicated... <laughs> Yeah. You're amazing. So of your 197 that you listed, yeah. how many of those actually sold? Low 100s. And how do you manage, because you have to have very long contracts for those yeah, that six months. on market, mm -hmm. so six months. Yeah. How do you manage that? Because you're physically not going to open them every weekend, are you? Yeah. No, no. And how do you manage the client expectation? <clears throat> yeah. So you manage it in that initial upfront meeting. So remember how I said I start every day at 9 o'clock except... Wednesday. So Wednesday, I get up, do my exercise, and then um, quarter to seven, I'm on the phone. And I'm calling, or I've got my seller's sheet, which is um, written or typed, and I'm just calling. So I've got generally running with about 200 listings. Now, they're not all active, you know, so I've got what I call B listings. So you say, oh, Jay, don't worry about it, we're just having no luck, just pull it off the market and I'll say, all right, well, is it okay if I, I'll pull the sign down, no home opens, none of that stuff, but is it all right if I just keep it in mind and I'll just keep it on the net and I generally find you sell one of those sort of just flukes, <laughs> you sell one a month, you just get lucky, so they've still got a place and you still get buyer inquiry, which is subject to sale leads or you can swing them, so I still like having them. So they're not all active and I tell the people, I will never call you unless I've got a genuine buyer to go through, sign this, which will usually be a year listing. And they're happy, they're out of sight, out of mind. Most of the time, they, they, there's just no issue, issues. And as I said, you generally sell about one of those a month, which is about a dozen or so sales a year that you wouldn't have otherwise. And then what I do every Wednesday morning, I start my calls. So it's just a bit of paper like this, and it's like a little mini book. I get them to write it real small so there's not as many pages. It makes me feel better. And then I start calling. So you start with all the over east people and you're calling them up and you're saying, hey, Bob, just this week since... So I call them all every Wednesday. And you know what it's like. You probably hit 30% message banks. And all I'm looking at is 6 Smith Street, you're priced right or, or you're not. That's really all I care about. If you're priced right, I'm babysitting you until it sells. If you're not priced right, I'm having consistent conversations with you about why you're not priced right and what we need to do. And it will go something along the lines of, hi, Mrs. Smith, just touching base with you. Since I spoke to you last week, I've had no phone calls, viewings or inquiries on your home. And they're like, oh, what's the market dead? No, 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 the market's not dead. As an office last month, we sold 36, the month before 35, the month before 40. So no, we're selling plenty. Yours is overpriced in relation to other properties that you're competing against. Have you got online and had a look from the conversation we had a chat about last week? 
they have or they haven't. And you're just having these conversations. And then every second Saturday I do home opens and we're, well it depends how many people that do them. Um, we, we generally have a minimum of four and a maximum of eight and I do four home opens. So we start at nine to 9.30 and then 9.45, 10, 15, da da da. So there's up to 32 home opens can be done on a Saturday and the other seven reps that are doing them, my team plus the other reps in the office that want to do them, they text me five to 10 minutes before the home open finishes and I will call you up. So this will be the second call in the week. Hi, Mrs. Smith, just letting you know I'm locking up, leaving now. I had no one through your home open. And this is really normal. No one through. Oh, really? I feel really bad. And I'm, I'm waiting for them to lead the conversation. Something like, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, do you want to sell? Yeah, okay. You, you really need to address. The moment you price your property right, it will sell. And I can continue to sit here and babysit, uh, babysit you and blame the, the, the weather, the football scores, who's playing, this, that and the other. Or you can choose to be realistic about your price and it will sell. Now, they might then say, well, Jay, you told me that. Now, I, I'm very careful with how I phrase it now because if you go into a home they paid 300 for it and it's going to sell at 180 and you tell them 220 okay they get their head around it at that initial thing and it's like oh and then you've listed it at 220 and you've been on the market for two months and had no one through and then you're reducing it to 210 and then a month later 200 190 180 what do you reckon they think by your fourth price reduction they hate you with a passion don't they you're just an idiot that doesn't know. You fib to get a listing. You're just a typical real estate agent. <clears throat> so I've become very proficient at breaking your heart right up front in a way that I'm not going to lose the listing. You know, and for some people, you know, some people you can tell them straight and they love it. Most are okay. You can still tell them, but it's delicate. And then you've got those percentage of people, thank you, those percentage of people that you've just, you, if, you, if you tell them the truth, you're not going to get the listing, are you? So you've then got to give them a little bit of range, you know, so it'll be somewhere between 290 to 180, you know. <laughs> you've got to give this broad range and then I'll leave their home and sort of follow it up with an email. As discussed, your property will sell within the parameters of 180 to 290. I'm being a bit, a bit extreme in saying that, but you get my drift. So you've just got to manage the people that you're with and then you've got expectations set up up front. And now, at what point do you start reducing in this market? First week? Yeah. So I'll, I will have the listing signed under my arm. Now, guys, just something I forgot to tell you. And they'll be like, oh, what's that? And so listen, I just forgot to say, so what's going to happen the moment I'm going to know whether your property's priced right, do you know how long it's going to take me to know whether your property's priced right? No. What, like a month, two months? No. Um, within 24 hours. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm, I'm saying, so when your property goes live, within 24 hours, if I've had no phone calls, viewings, emails text messages, anything on your property, it's overpriced. What do you mean? Well, you think about it. How's everyone going to find about, out about your home? On the internet. Everyone that's looking to buy a home is probably signed up to realestate.com or domain alerts, aren't they? Would there be anyone that's not? No. So the moment we push enter, upload it, those people within seconds will get a on your phone, now, all they're going to do is look at 6 Smith Street and the price and then from there they'll think, okay, it's priced right or it's not. If it's not priced right, do you know what they do? Save it. Because they're sitting there going, okay, this one's unrealistic. So every time you see a save, that means one person is vocalising you're unrealistic. And they're saving it, waiting for the third, fourth or fifth price reduction until this person's met the market. So if I've had no interest within 24 hours, we have a problem. And I build that up from listing to marketing to getting it on the market, the, um, 
the lady that does Erin that does my listings, she's letting them know, hey, it's, you know, and, and so that first day I'm getting the phone calls, the text messages, you know, it's like when your finance is due, they're calling you, has it come in, has it come in? It's that same thing. And I'm like, oh, bugger. All right, we didn't, and they're usually calling me. I, 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 I say to them, I will call you if I've had any interest. Because I'm as anxious as you are to see how it's gone. Now, they can't get through the whole day. They'll get a text, a messenger, something. How do we go? And I'll say, now, if it's priced right, I won't, you know, lead them to the gallows. I will let them know, hey, just be patient, okay? It didn't happen as quick as we want. But you see, so a price reduction within 24 hours may be required. And at that point, I say, well, what's going to be our plan B? if we don't get any interest. And they're sitting there going, oh, well, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to pull your furniture out and put new furniture? Are we going to paint the... What do you think plan B would be as a real estate agent? It's a really good question to ask your agent. You put it on, here's the strategy. Now in Bunbury, I would say 70% of people are on their third, fourth or fifth price reduction before they sell. So I'm letting them know that. I'm saying here's all the case studies. So you could price your property um, I was saying if there was a whiteboard. You could price your property, that's all right, Sorry, <laughs> and most people start here and then they go to there and then they go to there and you're starting this process of dropping the price every month for five or six months. Now you think about the third, fourth or fifth price reduction from a seller. What's the mindset? They're so sick of this process. A, a buyer, what do you think the mindset of a buyer is? We'll just continue to wait, it keep, keeps on going down. And the market this year in Bunbury, January through to April, has fallen at a rate that has just blown my hair back. It has been unbelievable. I rolled around to the start of this year thinking, oh, this will be the year. I've been saying it every year for the last 12 years. This is the year that things are going to pick up. And then it dropped this... It dropped this uh, the first four months of this year at a rate that was just like, man, the only properties you could get any interest on were mortgagee sales that were on the third, fourth or fifth price reduction. If you just were trying to sell something remotely close to cheap, you couldn't sell it. There was no demand. Why would you want to buy a house in Bunbury? All they do is drop. They're no longer an asset, they're a liability. So you, you just had to be really, really transparent with a seller and then I would be saying, okay, plan B for us is let's look at the next price point. And you just talk pricing with them. What's the best way to get a phone to ring? Marketing and price, that's it. There's the price, it's realistic and you've got it out there through marketing. So if the phones aren't ringing, if we had the price on at half the price, would it ring? Yeah. Okay, so you've got to find that sweet spot. Now you as a seller, you're all the same. You want too much. The buyers are all the same. They want to pay too little. What's the mentality of a buyer at the moment? Well, unless I can get it down here, I want to hedge because the market keeps dropping. So I want to make sure I've got a price, I've got it at a price point that is so juicy that if I unexpectedly had to sell it in two years' time, hopefully the market, I'm going to at least recoup my money. So when a seller gets almost their head out of their backside and sees that, they're willing to hear suggestions and best ways to go about it. Now I can just go to property after property after property that we've sold the eventual sale price need not be. It wasn't required that we sold it at that price. Had have they taken on board the initial advice to price it realistically? And of course we should still sell it in the first 60 days. And of course your best sales are up front. But if you want to run the gauntlet and overprice it, it's against my better judgment. Now I'm prepared to list, miss the listing. You can go and list it with Joe Blow, Ray White down the road but you will go through that process. Because, you know, with that amount of stock, I'm not going to cry for too long if I miss a listing. I still will cry, but not for too long. So it's, it's, it's doing it in a way 
where people are like, yeah, I get it, I see it. You're not just giving me a pitch here. Um, I can see the consequence for, let's just try. Let's give it a go. Maybe we can reduce it down the track. Now, most of my, it's probably half and half, or not even half and half, I don't know, I haven't kept stats, but I'm getting better and better at the harder conversations up front, talking them through the process, just of, of everything. But as I said, when they're already a hundred grand below what they paid for it and their mortgage is there and, you know, you guys know what it's like, it's, it's tough. It's, there's no other way of getting around it. It is a really tough industry. But unless you're prepared to just really nicely help them see you're going to struggle to get sales at the end of the month. And get valued into your sellers, Jay, in that sort of a climate. Mm, good question. Well, the value add is no longer in getting your world record price. It's getting it sold before the market slips further. Because there's so many properties, like literally names, addresses, people that they will know that I can rattle off. Look, look at what they went through. Reduce, started here, reduce, reduce. Nine, 12 months later, it's sold for that. Now, okay, they sold it, but they could have got way more if they had an agent that had this conversation with them. So it's getting it sold before the market slides. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, I sold one in Treendale, nine Electra Lane in Treendale. And <clears throat> let me just get my numbers right here. We had an offer at 382500 um, from this Indian couple that bought it. And the lady was a referral from her brother who I've sold a few for. She's got bank pressure on her and her mortgage was that, can we try? And as I said, I, her brother's been a really good referrer to me and over the years. And I explained, her name's Megan, I explained the status to her, well listen, give it a go, but very quickly let's reassess. We put it on and she made a liar out of me. We got 382,500. Wow, amazing. Now of course, finance falls over, why did it fall over? The guy realised he'd paid too much. Da, da 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 Then six months later, so you know what they're like when they've had an offer. Will someone else pay it? Death by a thousand cuts, death by subject, so death by previous offer, call it whatever you want. You then got a hell of a fight to now get it priced right. I thought it was around the 350s. And as I said, we got that lucky offer that surprised us all. Um, mind you, no, I won't say what I was about to say. <laughs> so then the next offer, about six months later, was 347. Now, of course, finance falls over. You're not doing your job unless you sell properties two to three times, apparently, these days. <laughs> then that falls over, and then a guy in Perth bought it sight unseen, Bevan Tarrett, if you know him. Um, he bought it sight unseen for 300,000. So you think about that, and that's all within the space of a year. Now that was earlier on this year, well, probably around April-ish. Remember how I said just boom, and then this four months have just been like, wow, what is going on? You know, it's just $23,000 for a property in Bunbury. You can't even buy a caravan for that, let alone a house. So we're, we're sitting there, and we're having conversations like our kids' lives depend on the outcomes of these conversations. Now, if you're dealing with a seller that's unmotivated and you can't do that, well, you've got to have a game plan. What's the benefit of having that listing? Well, some of them, there's a big benefit because you might be tapping into an area, you can feed off it, subject to sale, inquire, there may be a benefit. But if there's not, unfortunately, they're no good to us. Any questions in regards to any of that? I'm doing all the talking here, folks. Did you have a question? No? Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, why, why are you selling? Why would you choose to sell in this market if you're in no hurry? Oh, we're going caravanning. Okay, so now you've got to create urgency. We're going caravanning. 
take the keys, and they're genuinely in no hurry. If you can jag a buyer, go for it. And you say to them, all right, can I, would you listen to some advice? And they say, I was hoping you'd say yes, but most people do. Um, and they say, yep, we'd, we'd, we'd take on some advice. All right, you want to get as much as you can for it. Yeah, so getting top dollar is what it's about. Well, let's look through what it's realistically worth. Now, does anyone find, even with like the most Italian of Italian buyers, you know, the ones I mean, you're sitting there and you're showing them the properties online, here's the photos, there's the price. Like, you really got to be pretty far removed from reality not to be able to get it, don't you? So, here's what's sold, here's my iPad, bing, bing, bing. And the wife sort of, you know, saying her comments and then you're like, well, let's have a look at what's sold. That was pretty bad, but let's actually have a look at what's sold. Bing, bing, whoa. And all of a sudden, they're like, okay, they've been body slammed into reality. So what was it you wanted me to get? Again, we're looking at properties that are selling for 300. What were you saying? 400. Okay. When were you planning on moving from here? What? So you would only sell if you could get 400. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. All right, based on what you've seen, remembering pricing's got nothing to do with me, you're just a byproduct of the market, how long do you think it's going to take to get your 400,000? This 100,000 above market value. Oh, well, you never, in Bunbury everyone's talking about the lithium plant. It's so damn annoying. Lithium plant, like, how has that affected house prices? Um... And, I, and then you talk them through, and you've just got to be their financial planner, financial planner for five minutes. So you sell it. So let's just hypothetically say I did sell it for 400,000. Do you know the only way that contract will go through? Yeah. Valuers are going to come in and squash a deal, so it's not possibility. So what I need pretty much is a tourist that comes off a boat that's blind that's got cash to get your home sold. When, when you really break it down, don't you? And they're like, yeah. So it's not going to happen. You, you, you know, it, it's, it's totally unrealistic that it's going to happen. But let's look if you sit on this for the next two to three years. I'll tell you where this will end up. You don't know. You've got no pressure, money in the bank, you're cruisy. I'll tell you what you're going to do because I know lots of people that have been in your situation. They give it to an agent and, the, and a year will go by. You'll come and have your holiday and then you'll, you'll talk about it while you're travelling around Australia and you'll say, all right, well, when we get home, we'll get serious about it. It's already been on the market for a year. You'll say, that agent's useless. You'll get a new agent in and you'll go through that process three, four or five times. You'll eventually find an agent that on your fifth, on your fifth agent, you will stop blaming the market, the house, the weather, the lithium, e everything that you can think of. And you will eventually get to the point where your financial situation won't change, but it's the hassle. You want to move on with your life. And then you will eventually price it right, but because it's been on the market for so long, you'll sell it there and you'll have, you'll have had no offers in that period of time that you'll take an a low offer. You'll hate the agents, you'll hate the market, you'll hate the price, it'll be a disappointment it's much easier to be realistic. Now, if you sit and wait for 10 years, which of course you can do, and you eventually get that price, well, how's your financial position any better anyway? Everything's gone up, you're paying more. So sell or sit, but don't fluff around in the middle. Now, when you sit there and have just really honest conversations with people, and you can dig at them a bit, like, come on, you know, it's like saying you're holding Commodore here, that you bought for 20 grand is worth 30. It's not. Cars go down. And in certain cycles within a market, so do houses. For 12 years now, 07, we've been on a declining market. I've sold one house four times to four investors. Every time they've lost money on it, every time it was a good buy, I'm the only person to have made any money at it and I never owned it. <laughs> so why would you invest in Bunbury? You just wouldn't, would you? You wouldn't. So the people that I'm dealing with are simply people that want to live in a house. They've, everyone needs a house. 
Unfortunately, we're not selling luxury boats or cars. You need a house, so there's always going to be a market. But that buyer is typically looking at between 14 and 20 properties before they purchase one. So, like, hello, what are they going to buy? The biggest, best, flashiest, newest, well-priced property. And if that's not you, you won't sell. And then you've got to sell quick because the market is falling and has been falling, hasn't it? And they're like, yeah, it has. So what do you want to do? So every, every listing presentation that I do, I used to have this U Butte listing presentation and you'd cover everything, you know. Now it's probably 90% on this. Got all these little diagrams that are written on scrap bits of paper and I go through it and I explain to them the consequence for not selling. This is the consequence for not selling in Bunbury. And they already know it, unless they've got their head under a rock. Um, have you ever not received a commission? Yeah. In One Ennis Street. The guy's, he's got the cafe <laughs> near the Subiaco Oval. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> Go and have a wine and don't pay him. <laughs> yeah. It was 20 grand as well. Is One Ennis Street. Oh, no, because apparently, I didn't realise this, you can tell your settlement agent, don't pay him the commission, I'll pay it. I, always, I didn't know that, but I do now. So, you know, he's moved to Perth and he owes lots of people lots of money and I'm one of them. And That's why you want a big stack, wasn't it? Yeah, well... How do you stay positive, Jay, in that sort of climate? Uh, results. As long as I'm getting my sales at the end of the month, I'm nice to people. <laughs> yeah, so like people say, how do you stay motivated? Well, if you're getting results, it's sort of like going to the gym, you know, if you're exercising hard and eating well and you're losing a little bit of weight here and there, you're motivated to go, aren't you? It's no different with sales or anything in your life. You know, you love being married when your marriage is becoming better. Um, and it's the same in real estate. But unfortunately for real estate, it is so brutally, unfairly hard at the moment. And I just think, you know, I, I know our number two competitor. We, we've been the, so Mandra, who, who is Mandra? So I think you guys pipped us this year. So I think you came fourth, which is really, sorry to everyone else in the room, <laughs> which is really the highest, which is really the number one office in WA because the others above your sell lease property and right around it, they're multiple offices, but individual offices, and we were the highest individual office in Bunbury last year and second to you guys this year, and we're in regional Bunbury, blue collar Bunbury, drive through it, see what, what it's like. It's a, I mean, I'm not ripping on Bunbury, but like, have a look at this. Our last TV ad. Like this. Pardon? Well, the, the, you know, Bunbury's so exciting, we did a TV ad on getting a new playground. we got to promote in Bunbury, but yeah, it's, it's just, a, it's, yeah, it's fun. And so I stay motivated by my claim to fame, probably early on, you know, like anyone, you, you're trying to get ahead, <clears throat> um, but it's no, it's so far down the priority list for me, real estate now, that I've got a wonderful life and when I'm at work, I work hard to get away to be with my wife and kids and you know, I've got a really, I've got over 50 nieces and nephews all living in Bunbury. So most nights you've got, you know, not like five people over, you've got like 25 people. Like last night I had tons of people. The weekend, you know, just gone down in Cary Valley. Um, even though it was my home open weekend, I just didn't do it. But... We're all down in Cary Valley and, you know, you, like, you book out half the resort with all your family going down. And Except you're only open every second weekend. Yeah. Yeah, every second weekend. I was just going to make an observation, not really a question, but basically you've done all the back-end stuff consistently and really well and it's real estate 101, you know, get your system with your newsletters, um, do your calls. I mean, there have been very many different agents here that are doing hundreds of calls. <laughs> 
a day, yeah. Um, and doing that groundwork. Yeah. Um, and then we all think, why aren't we achieving the results? That's why. Mm. It's, yeah. It's, uh, I made it a good credit to you that you've been so consistent for the years. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so that, that, that's pretty much in a, nut, it, in a nutshell. If you looked at it and said, if I took a snapshot of your last week, for example, sir, and said, you know, I'm sitting there chalking up the actual activities you're doing throughout a week to find new business, what are they? You know, and, and you might be doing lots and therefore getting lots of leads, but if you're doing it and it's working, keep doing it. Now there's the wonderful world of like Mr. Twiddle with all this digital stuff that's amazing. I don't even have a computer on my desk, you know, so I'm not that guy. Mine has just been, as I said, a bit of a blockhead approach where you just dung, dung, dung. But it's worked for me. Any further questions? I've still got a couple of things if you... So the, every, we, we run heaps of these ads in Bunbury. So whenever you sell a property and they're a business, we said, all right, what we'll do is we'll do a TV ad for you. So we'll get your business out there. And at the end, you, you just got to so you bought or sold with us, whatever they did. Everyone's like, oh, yeah. So we've got tons of these. So we do a lot of TV advertising because it's quite cheap in Bunbury. It's very cheap. And so this just this is an, a, an example of one of many that we do. I was lucky enough to grow up in Boynup, and so the Southwest has always been in my blood. After graduation, I went travelling for around 10 years, but really you've always got to come home when you come from such a beautiful area. I'm one of these lucky guys who gets to live my dream. I've always <laughs> wanted to be a vet. I absolutely love my job, and I love living in the Southwest. Hi, my name is Braden Collins. I'm one of the owners of the Bunbury Neaton Vet Clinics and I sold my house through Bar and Stanley Real Estate. So you know how like Bunnings do an ad and it's blah blah in the middle, lowest prices are just the beginning. That's, we copied that for a real estate thing where you've got an ad and everyone watches, oh what the hell is this about? Everyone knows that guy. So rather than just saying, hey we're really good, everyone knows that guy or lots of people would know him and then at the end, oh it's a Bar and Stanley ad. So we've had really good mileage from that. Um, the other thing that I do, so you sell a property, I never deal with buyers. And then you're like, well, how do you, how do you have a relationship with them? So this is how I deal with um, ongoing buyers whom I've never met. And like you invite them to the family fun day. It's the worst day of my life, the family fun day, because I'm sitting there like trying to, who the hell is that person? And I take my you know, thing to try and, oh, it could be this guy, and <laughs> it's so annoying. Anyway, so, so if I sold your property, it, it looks like this. We sell it, Henri looks after you from, you know, so Josh gets the offer, gives it to me, I call the seller, and I say to the seller, hey, Mr. Seller, we've got an offer, um, would you like to do it over the phone, or would you like to catch up in person? And if they say they want to catch up in person, I just say, um, okay, well, I can't do it. I've got appointments, so I won't get there till probably about 8.30 tonight. And if they say that's okay, then I say, oh, actually, sorry, no, I won't be able to get there till <laughs> the following night. So in other words, I don't want to see you. Um, and then I will email the offer through. So I'll negotiate it, get it all together, email the offer through, sign sealed by both parties, Josh deals with the buyer, deals together. Then... It goes to Henri and both buyer and seller are reminded and explained about Henri, how wonderful she is. She's a mother of three, ex-real estate agent, absolutely, you know, those amazing people. She's one of them. So Henri is going to look after you from now through to settlement and her job is to make sure this is a really seamless exercise. And she goes so far above and beyond. She actually works from home a few days now. That's how much I trust her. And, um, and she does it all, she meets with them and she's become friends with these people. One of the ladies has joined her church to give you an idea of how, um, you know, amazing she is. It settles, I then get a text message saying, six Smith Street settled, buyer and seller's number. And I explain to the seller and Josh says to the buyer, listen, if you called me up throughout that settlement process and said, oh, what's happening with this? I will walk down and speak to Henri and she will tell me. So we aren't hands-on. So you really give her ownership of it. It's so annoying getting calls in the settlement process. And then, then the property settles. Text message comes through. 
I call the buyer and the seller up and I say, thank, and, I, and I sincerely mean this, I'm not just saying that, thank you so much for letting us help. I really appreciate it. You've been wonderful to deal with and da 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 da. And I have a sincere chat where I express my gratitude and I let them know how thankful I am and I know they could have picked any other agent but I am tickled pink. Thank you, bye. Then um, they get their normal gift that goes out, you know, just blah, blah. And then I call the, and I do that to the buyer and the seller. And with the buyer, hi, great to speak to you. Oh man, I can't believe you've bought a house off me and I've never met you. I do that with every single person, but <laughs> I tell that to them. And um, so it's just amazing how it all worked out. But anyway, how was Josh? How was, oh, and they speak really, they speak volumes of them. And then I call, so now my relationship has started. I've already got a relationship with the seller. Now my relationship starts with the buyer. I then call the buyer the day after settlement. So the day of settlement, the day after settlement, a week, a month, six months, 12 months. Then they get 12 newsletters. So six plus 12, that's 18. And then they get two invites to client gifts a year, to client functions a year. And then, and then I send 15 gifts post-settlement to the buyer and the seller. So they get their stock standard gift for settlement and then a month after settlement, they get two movie tickets to buyer and seller with a card <coughs> that says, thanks, you've been great, blah, 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 generic card. Um, and they don't expect that, do they? You know, you, you have long since come and gone. And I always get a text message or an email, hey, thanks, Didn't, was really surprised to get that. And then at the two-month mark, so that's one, two, the two-month mark, they get a um, fruit hamper, which is just a box of fruit. It's about 50 bucks and it's all seasonal fruit and it gets delivered, as all the gifts do, uh, well, ideally do, to their work. And so they get this big fruit hamper, just say, hey, I was just thinking about you, I just want to let you know, once again, I am so thankful that you gave me the opportunity to help you. It's not forgotten with me, thank you. And then at the third mark, and once again, they contact me to say thanks, because these are unexpected gifts. And then at the third month, Henri contacts the buyer and the seller because she has contact with them and says, hey, Jay's just come into my office and said he really wants to do something for you. He wants to send you a magazine subscription. I'm going to send you an email now. Whatever your interests are, boom, boom, boom. And so they pick out fishing, for example. It goes to their house and on the little blurb, it's got my name, their address. And so for every month, they're getting a magazine and it's just another point. So you think 15 gifts, 12 thingies, newsletters, two client invites. There's a lot of contact there in that month. And then every single day, I call 12 people from my database and I just say, hey, it's Jay. Well, you, you, I hope I don't even need to say that. I say, hey, Bob, how are you going? Um, it's Jay. You know, I hope I don't have to say it's Jay Stanley from Bar and Stanley Real Estate. It's Jay. Oh, how are you going, Jay? And then you have a real brief chat and I say, listen, the reason I'm calling Bob is I really need your help. My real estate listings are, hello? <laughs> well, um, who do you know that's thinking of buying or selling any real estate? And I've found doing that every day, generally you get one person that will say such and such, such and such. So it's just those little things. And you can see it's so simple, none of this, Anyone could do any of this, but it's just nurturing a lot of relationships over a very long period of time, um, and now it seems to work. All right, well, I've, I've said enough. Any questions? One last question yep. about your family fund day. Is that open to the public? Or yeah, it is. That's why it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing it. The last one, as I said, there was 7,000, but there's no way of knowing... And what we do is we have all, you know, like three Mr. Whippy trucks, um, donuts, petting zoos, and we've got all these little things. And I'm not joking, people were standing in lines for an hour and a half. And I'm like, how bad do you want to pat a sheep? You know, it's, or whatever they were doing. It was just, it was, they've just grown to the point. And, and as I said, we were doing two a year, but the last one we did 
which was in November, at the end of it, we just felt like we'd been, felt like we'd been hit by a freight train. There was so... I mean, it was orderly, but with that many people there, you just... Like, there's security issues and... Like, the parking went forever. Like, it was amazing. Like, so many people came to... Went to come, but you've got to, like, get a taxi to get to the thing. Like, and I'm not joking. It was... You had to park so far away. So we were just like, man, where do you go from here? But anyway, we're going to roll the... What, what we're, what we're going to do this time is because it goes from 11 to 3 and we're, this is the way we're going to tackle it. So right at the 11th hour, because we run our ads on TV, at the 11th hour, people are having like kids' birthday parties and <laughs> it's just a debacle. Um, so we now, the first two hours... We're going to advertise it right at the 11th hour, but advertise it to all our clients and say from 11 to 1, it's clients only. So you're not going to have tons of people there. And then from 1 to 3, it's, it's only 1 to 3 that the general public think it's open. So we'll see how that goes. Hmm. All right, thanks, everyone. Any other questions? Or Yeah. No. Oh, no, it's not overkill. I just, I've just never collected email addresses. Yeah. Yeah. Which, as I said, you got to remember, I, I set all this up a long time ago, and I've just never evolved. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you, there'd be a lot better ways of doing it. So, you, I, when when you're hearing this, I would just pick out pieces. Because you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, I mean, you just think of the cost. What is it? It's a dollar a letter now. Um, yeah, so just pick out pieces that you think, yeah, I could do that or whatever. All right, folks, give it up for Jay. Thanks a million, guys. <laughs>